Good evening, friends, comrades, viewers, and future members. We welcome you to the regular, regular live weekly broadcast from the Workers' Party of Britain. We have plenty of great member contributions lined up, but first, as always, we'll hear from our leader, the master strategist, the political Tyson Fury, George Galloway. Thank you. Your introductions are so fantastic. Thank you very much, Tess. Welcome uh, to the comrades of the Workers' Party of Britain and to the members of the public watching now or later uh, to this regular Wednesday night viewing. Uh, which is still doing really well, uh, more than a year, I think, now after we started them. We are the party that didn't let the virus beat us in the sense of our ceaseless efforts everywhere, online and on the streets, to turn the political tables here in Britain, to change the narrative, change the political landscape, change the prevailing orthodoxies. Let me start with the obvious. If I had announced on Sunday uh, that I was going to cast my vote for a nauseating Blairite supporter of the Iraq war slaughter, which has killed a million people and which continues to reverberate to this very day. If I had said I was going to vote for that nauseating Blairite supporter of the Iraq war. And by the way, there are plenty of those in other parts of Scotland that I would have had to vote for. If I had said I was going to vote for uh, somebody who supported the privatization through the PFI contracts and all the other uh, wheezes that the Blair and Brown era had uh, pioneered and paved the way for Boris Johnson today to continue to complete the job, nobody would have said a thing. That in itself illustrates the madness for us as supporters of a completely different kind of politics in the current electoral system. I happen to live in a constituency where it's either the Conservative or the SNP that will win the election in my constituency. As for nine months, I have been promulgating, proselytizing a strategy of tactical voting in order to bring down the SNP administration about which more later. It's almost as if uh, some people didn't understand what that meant didn't understand that it would mean in the great majority of constituencies, we'd be asking people to vote Labour in the second greatest number, asking them to vote Conservative and in the third uh, most uh, number of constituencies, asking them to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Because we believe uh, that the breaking up of the working class in Britain into two states is an existential matter. Just as I, and uh, you'll recall uh, Furore uh, some time ago, uh, when I voted for Nigel Farage's Brexit party, it was because we regarded the issue of Brexit as an existential party and their uh, existential matter. And therefore we were going to vote for a party uh, that we would not ordinarily have done uh, in order to bring about Brexit. And it worked, kind of an important qualification that, and it worked. The reality is, uh, if, a, if an arse could have three cheeks, uh, the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats would all be one of the cheeks of that three-cheeked arse. Uh, but we believe uh, that the uh, prospect of breaking up the country forever, don't forget, Tories are for Christmas, separatism is forever. One day we'll vote the uh, Conservatives and Labour out, but you can't vote separatism out. Once the country is divided, it's divided forever with all the negative, deleterious 
consequences of that. So if you regard the uh, question of the breakup of Britain as an existential question, which I do, uh, then you have to do everything that you can within the bounds uh, of the existing political dispensation in the country to bring it about. In short, we see no difference between the Conservatives and Labour, and for that matter, the Liberal Democrats. No difference at all. It's not that one cheek of the three cheek arse is more attractive. Uh, if it were, it wouldn't be the Labour one. This is uh, something that people will have to face. Labour are worse than the Conservatives for two reasons. First of all, the Conservatives don't pretend to be a party of the working class. The Conservatives are quite unashamed about what they are and who they stand for. Labour has deceived the working class in Britain uh, for a very long time, arguably uh, for very many decades, arguably throughout all or virtually all of its existence. Labour robs the working class of their money uh, through the uh, trade union levy and of their hopes and dreams for the future. It pretends to the working class that it will deliver something for them and does not. Instead, makes their lives more miserable. Uh, Labour has launched as many imperialist wars, I haven't counted them up, actually I ought to, uh, maybe even more imperialist wars uh, than the Conservatives have. So for us, it, Labour is not more attractive more palatable to have to vote for, but less attractive and less palatable for that reason that I've just given. And here's another one. Labour is now to the right of the Conservative Party on the economy. As you'll see when the voting comes uh, in the budget, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Tory Chancellor of the Exchequer, is proposing something like, not nearly as good enough, uh, but something like our corona tax. He is going to make big business pay an increased amount of corporation tax, that's profits tax uh, for uh, the ordinary man and woman. He's going to impose a substantial rise in profit tax and Labour is going to vote against it, against it. So Labour is now standing in front of the working class of Britain as a party to the right of the Conservatives on the economy and, of course, on all other matters that matter to us. Labour is openly egging on at the Conservatives when it comes to foreign policy towards China, towards Russia, towards Iran, uh, towards Venezuela. Uh, so don't tell me, please, that I should have voted for the no-hope Labour candidate in my constituency, even especially as in doing so, I'd only be helping to put the SNP into power again. There's no getting away from it. Uh, I deliberately chose Sunday to launch uh, the news uh, that our policy would require me to vote for the sitting MSP uh, against his SNP challenger, precisely to open uh, the doors uh, for people to contemplate the meaning of our policy, which we then launched a tsunami uh, of uh, propaganda for Labour, Liberal and the Conservatives in each a parliamentary constituency. I must say we've done a better job promoting them than their own parties have. And I hope that the strategy will work. It needs to work. If anyone has been following the sordid, grotesque, bizarre, unbelievable, almost literally unbelievable saga of the Salmon Sturgeon affair, where the 
former First Minister Alex Salmond, uh, has credibly accused his successor as leader of the SNP and leader of the Scottish government to, uh, of trying falsely to imprison him on trumped up charges. And as uh, each day, to put it in the words of ITV's political correspondent today, one by one, the claims that Alex Salmon made that were described as conspiracy theories have been stood up. And I don't think there are many people any longer uh, in Scotland or in Britain that have been paying attention uh, in the rest of Britain. It's now in any doubt uh, that what I said from the start was true, that Alex Salmond was framed. And we now know who and what framed him. So a party like that, which seeks to break up forever uh, the uh, small island on which we live, simply mustn't be allowed to continue in power. Not just because of the absolute uh, cod that they have, you'll forgive the fishy pun, uh, the absolute cod that they've made of running Scotland with everything that was once famous about Scotland now uh, in a pile of ash, uh, the education system that was once really something to see uh, is now so bad that the OECD report into it has had to be suppressed until June, once the elections are safely by. The health service, ditto, uh, and all uh, manner of other things, including the uh, quite important, actually, separation of powers. We now have uh, uh, a government which has subverted the legal system to the point that uh, law officers think that they can and did, in fact, this uh, very uh, last seven days uh, can, uh, no, in fact, on Monday, two days ago, uh, the Lord Advocate warned, warned the members of the parliament what they could and couldn't ask him about and warned them not to say anything that would call into question the crown and the integrity of the people working for it. The fact that he's actually in league and a part of a government that wants to destroy the crown is of course uh, merely an ironic footnote. The fact that all the police forces in Scotland have been centralized into one police force. So the chief minister, only has to ensure the loyalty, let me put it that way, of a single chief constable uh, in order to control the police force of an entire country, uh, which is normally a step on the road uh, to the end of democracy in that country. And there's a very real pressing danger of that. And we discovered in Scotland uh, in the last few weeks that we are in a uniquely vulnerable situation uh, because the government controls the police, the government controls the crown uh, and its uh, role as public prosecutor and can arrange the prosecution of anyone. And that prosecution can be certain to follow. So uh, for all kinds of reasons, we have to get rid of the SNP, but we have a bigger reason than that. We believe that this small island, uh, 310 years nearly united, more than 310 years united, uh, should not be broken up because it will weaken uh, the working class movement and the potential uh, for the socialism in which we believe ever to be achieved. Because forevermore, uh, everything would be uh, turning on a line which had been unnecessarily and artificially drawn across our small country, and all conflicts would be reduced to that. Uh, England would have to put up a wall, I'm not joking, an actual wall, because Scotland intends to rejoin the EU if uh, Nicola Sturgeon uh, gets away with it. That would bring back the free movement of EU labour, uh, which we have now stopped in the rest of the United Kingdom, and therefore the possibility of uh, goods and people 
crossing an unmanned border, uh, undermining uh, the policies of the British state would require a wall, a wall across our country after more than 310 years. Are you serious? How could a wall be in the interest of the working class people on either side of that wall? Uh, the economic conditions that would uh, obtain in Scotland would be certain uh, to be even worse than the economic conditions which prevail today, not least because to get into the European Union, Scotland would have to eliminate two thirds, two pounds in every three pounds of public expenditure in order to meet the convergence criteria to join the euro which we would be required to join if we were to be given entry into the European Union. Two thirds of all public expenditure in Scotland would have to be wiped out. Just think about that for a moment. And this is a country uh, uniquely uh, dependent on uh, the public sector for employment. The, uh, the economic consequences would be catastrophic. We hope one day we aspire one day to lead this state and we want it to be the state we have been historically uh, a united country uh, where uh, the people who are in it wherever they originally came from are one people not two people not three not four but one people and that one people uh, we will seek to lead in the direction of our 10-point program of our socialist perspective. So on an ideological level and on a day-to-day -day practical political level, the breakup of our country is not in the interests of our project and of the working class in general, and therefore we oppose it. And we will do whatever we have to do uh, to stop it from happening and get back to normal politics. Now, at least half the country, maybe more, I hope more, but at least half of the country is behind me on this. It's, uh, it's uh, sometimes felt, or at least one is led to feel, uh, that the SNP speak for Scotland, but the SNP have never, ever, received 50% of the vote in Scotland. The number of people who voted for Brexit in Scotland is greater than the number of people who have ever voted for the SNP. They're in power only because the pro-Britain parties cut each other's throats at election time and uh, deliver victory to the SNP. And that's why the tactical voting is going to be so important uh, in May. So uh, half the country is right behind me. That's not bad, is it? Half the country? I wish half the country in England was behind us. Half the country. Our prestige standing in this country of Scotland has never been greater. As you can see, if you uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, and once this is all over, once we've achieved this, the Workers' Party of Britain in Scotland will have fantastic opportunities to grow, to stand and win elections, to supplant the Labour Party in the hearts of working class people in Scotland. And I'm going to make sure of that. As soon as the threat of the breakup of the country is over, we'll be on the road with the Workers' Party of Britain, which has many members in Scotland, but will, I promise you, uh, over the next couple of years, become our strongest section in the whole of Britain. And we will fight for the interests of the working class people of Scotland, but we will do so within the perspective that we are seeking to build socialism in this green and pleasant land, not just in one part of it. Uh, the 
uh, election on, uh, I think it's two weeks now, uh, two weeks on Thursday, uh, of Paul Burroughs in Helensborough is going to be important. And I'm sure that the party is doing everything it can to mobilize as many people as possible to get out on the streets and take Paul's message to the people of Helensborough and Lowman South. But that's just the beginning. We've only had a couple of weeks uh, to fight this, and we've not been allowed to fight it because of the legal restrictions on campaigning. But in every election after May, we'll be there in far greater force and with even greater prospects of success. So I'll be able to go to half of the country and say, I helped to save this country. And now I need you to look at us in the Workers' Party. You need to look at what we're saying and what we think needs to be done. I think the prospects are rosy in that regard. Uh, just a few words on the uh, continued uh, deterioration of the Labour Party, which you will recall uh, was going to be 20 points ahead of the Tories once they got rid of that troublesome Mr. Corbyn. Well, they're not 20 points ahead. In the latest polls, they are eight points behind. Someone can do the percentage of the level of failure that that represents, as opposed to the claimed outcome of appointing, electing Keith Starmer as the Labour Party leader. He's been a complete disaster. The new statesman has turned on him today. Uh, even John Rento, uh, Tony Blair's uh, representative on earth, uh, has turned against him. Many of the biggest Blairites have begun attacking Starmer. He's just not right-wing enough even for them. But I don't believe that he's going to be unhorsed. I don't believe that there's going to be a leadership challenge. I don't believe for one minute that there are the 40 or so Labour MPs that would be required to sign the nomination papers of a challenger. And I don't believe that in today's parliament, there is anyone uh, with either the bottle or the standing to uh, run against Keith Starmer. Keith Starmer is the leader. He's the bed they've made. They have to lie in it. And I reiterate what I said last week. To those, and there are still thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of genuine socialists in the Labour Party, for how long are you going to pretend to yourself that this situation can be turned around? That somehow you're going to be able to turn the clock back? The clock's been seized and you will never get your hands on it again. Its hands run according to a different tune. And that tune is not going to change. It is nakedly the policies of neoliberal economics and imperialist policies abroad. That is the Labour Party. You know it. You know it's not going to change. And so I'm asking you again, imploring you, to look at the Workers' Party's 10 points and tell me that those 10 points don't more closely relate to your own personal politics. And if you do that, then I ask you to join us and you can fashion together with the rest of us future policies, strategies, tactics, leaders. I, if, you, if, you, if it's me, if it's me that you don't like, we have lots of other leaders. I won't be here forever or anything like ever. So build us, help us to build a fighting alternative to the Labour Party, fighting for the affection and the support of the working class in Britain. That's the only way that we will ever bring about political change. Staying in something that requires you to struggle annually to elect a member or two of a national executive committee, which has no power 
and is utterly ignored by the people who are really running the party is really fool's gold, even if you were able to achieve it, which actually increasingly you are not. So I ask everyone who genuinely wants working class politics back in Britain and wants to play a part in something positive in what remains of their political lives, instead of negatively trying to defend something that is now an endangered species, namely socialism in the Labour Party, help build something which is already explicitly socialist. Common sense socialism. That's what we stand for. We're not liberals. We're not running around policing people's personal pronouns. We're not demanding uh, that uh, children be allowed to access uh, blockers to distort their uh, pubescent development. We're not running around calling people phobes and ists if they make the slightest error in their grammar or in their uh, speech or in their formulation. We stand for common sense socialism that goes with the grain of the culture of, the grain of the great people of Britain. We believe in Britain. What else can we do? This is where we live. We can't imagine ourselves to be Cubans or Venezuelans. Yeah? This is where we live. This is where we are. This is the place we have to fight. Britain's a great country, but it could be much, much better. And we are the people that have got the ideas to make it so. Come and join us in the Workers' Party of Britain. Thanks very much, Tess. Fantastic, George. We're all there. Uh... We're all excited now in the chat. I can see everybody's little pictures all smiling and happy because that was a really rousing thing. It's, um, yeah, come and join us and build from the ground up, get involved, get the chance to be running for a councillor. I mean, where where else do you get the chance to be a working class councillor? You, you, you just don't. You don't get the chance to even run for these things or try. So join us and come along. What was interesting in the chat, as you were talking about the Labour Party, is one of our members, Joey, um, summed it up really both of the wars i fought in were launched by labor so there we are That's okay that yeah they could do the numbers uh, but uh, the one that i remember most is of course the one we launched the one labor launched in 2003 we launched a devastating attack on iraq and on afghanistan we have caused the death, directly and indirectly, of well over a million people. A war which spawned the excrescence of ISIS, which has cascaded all over the world. The level of crime that that is almost cannot be properly stated. And it was done by labor. And some people still say, you've still automatically got to vote for them. No thanks. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone wake up. Okay, first up this week we have Georgie, lovely Georgie. So I'm going to ask you to unmute there, Dal. I'm here. Hello, Hello everybody. How wonderful. Hello, to see George. You. Long time no see. Yes. I might just give you a quick flash of my daughter who's recently joined us. There you go. Hello, welcome she might talk to your you daughter. Later. Welcome. Jessica. What's her name? Jessica. Jess. Jessica, welcome on board to the Workers' Party. Right then, George. I, oh, I just want to echo what you said about the Labour Party, but because we've had this uh, Rishi Shunak, I can't even say his name, the budget today, um, I just wanted to say that it's good news that the celebrated £20 COVID uplift to uh, universal credit is going to remain till September. But it's just not enough, is it? Because the way I see it, the whole of the welfare system needs to be reformed so that we have a support network. That's what it's there for or should be there for to support, to support, strangely enough, people that can't work for whatever reason. 
And it doesn't do that. They use it as a cost to beat people up. It's like you have these benefit fraud programs or what have you. And there's a big stigma attached to anybody that has benefits. Well, with the pandemic, we've had hundreds of thousands of people that unfortunately have either been furloughed or put on universal credit. And thank God that they have done that 20 pounds extra a week. It's not a lot, actually. It doesn't buy you a lot in the local shops, does it? But that's that bit. But I've had activists speak to me from Deepak. So that's um, um, people, um, disabled people against cuts. I had to look that up because I've got what they stand for, but I know who they are. And um, they've said there's a lot of legacy benefits that disabled people might receive or people with disabilities might receive. They've had nothing extra. So we're ignoring them. And there's been a wonderful video by one of our comrades, um, Mark Adkins, I believe, um, going into you know more length about this, saying, well, what happens in September when it all gets cut again? What happens then? So that's my little rant for today. And just to introduce you to my lass, she might even speak to you if she's not feeling too shy. Jessica, tell us something about yourself. Go on, darling. I'm here. He doesn't bite. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Why did you join the workers' party last week? <laughs> <laughs> um, you were fed up with injustice. That's what you said to me. And you're fed up with never getting a job. Tell, tell him a bit more. If you want to. If you're feeling too shy. <laughs> I'll close don't, worry, don't worry, Jessica. Uh, you can come back uh, on another occasion in your own right. And Would you like to, to do us. that? Thank you very much indeed for joining the Workers' Party. And your mom's right, of course, as she is on everything else. Uh, the <laughs> that we would have given uh, if we'd been delivering a budget today uh, would, of course, have been entirely different. We welcome the extension to September. And between now and September, we intend to fight to build support in this country for a complete revolution in the uh, payment of welfare benefits. Even in our kind of society, there will be people who will not be able to work. But in a society like this <clears throat> one, where millions want to work but cannot find work, to add impoverishment to the <clears throat> injustice of forcing people into idleness is, of course, a crime. We stand for something completely different. But we are glad this extension has been made. We're glad of the extension of the furlough. Uh, we are sure that Sir Keith Starmer would not have done either if he mm. had been at the dispatch box on the Treasury bench today. Uh, we of course, say a plague on both your houses. We stand for a completely different kind of society where everyone who can work must work. Not just should, but must work. Everyone who can work under a socialist system must work. And those who cannot work must be supported by the rest of us in direct proportion to our own prosperity, not just income, because a lot of wealthy people avoid income tax perfectly legally, but our own prosperity, our wealth, our mansions, our big cars, our bank balances, our art on the walls, uh, and so on. Everyone should support those who cannot work in a decent and dignified uh, life, not this uh, scrambling around for an extra 20 pounds that had to be fought for tooth and nail, uh, but we got it and we've extended it and that's to the good. Absolutely, George. Absolutely. Great to see you as well, Jess. Uh, she did actually come to the environmental meeting on Friday night, so she's already getting involved. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from her, and it's nice to have the young uns on board. You're the future. <laughs> more of you, please. Okay, um, we've got now Dave. Are you there, Dave? I'm going to just ask you to unmute. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. I do. Good evening, George. Nice to see you again and an excellent uh, speech. I hope best wishes to you and your family and, and a loved ones, George. Thank you. Um, now, what I just want to say here is to, to make a couple of points about the, the myth of the small state working and as such. Um, this is still very much being banned about in media where the, it's often harkens back to oh well you have this and you have the industrial action and all this sort of things where we actually know that the most harm done to the world and our country and the um, economy was a result of the capitalist system the uh, financial crash was caused by a uh, corporate greed it was not are caused by the lowest paid or or the the vulnerable yet it's been largely the people who didn't cause it have had to uh, pay the bills for it uh, we've seen what a deregulation does when it turns essentially public services into private monopolies when really public services are for the public and should be regulated by the um, um, public. Many services in this country, including frontline services in mental health, in victim support, are supported by community and voluntary groups, such as Samaritans, County Lines, Victim Support, and they work with the police and the nine million unpaid carers who have stopped working purposely to care for loved ones, family or loved ones, they actually provide CQC level care that people would require residential care settings. So they, in many ways, have paid for these tax cuts for the well-off, this thing of having a small state. This is it's not the privileged few paying for the other services. It's all these people who've uh, paid for everything there. So what we want is a fair socialist system where everyone's supported equally. Um, I will. Um, I will just add that I think it's uh, relevant here. Um, we've seen the privatization such as ATOS in a PIP assessments where the assessments are not done by medi medically qualified people, they're done by a private company and most of them end up going to appeal and then winning them. So we've, we've seen that, we've seen what a privatization and lack of accountability does. Uh, we've seen successive governments, Conservative and Labour, uh, failing to regulate we, we shouldn't have a situation where large charities sh should allow their chief executives to earn more than 100,000 a year. Um, when I was at school, I went to school under the Thatcher era, secondary school, and bullying and abuse was a sadly widespread. I was a victim of sexual abuse at school. And at that point, funding had been stripped bare. So we've seen what that does between Conservatives and later governments uh, too, with Labour failing to regulate and as such. My abuser was as white as the driven snow and from the Church of England. Uh, when child abuse happens, it, it must be addressed wherever it happens, regardless of the ethnicity of the child, whether they're Christian, Muslim, whatever. Uh, we can't stop hate and terrorism by being hateful ourselves. I tried to explain to these groups that I've challenged that the same people you want to witch hunt will also witch hunt you. And to finish, I was attacked twice, once with an ashtray, once with a pool cue. The perpetrators were as white as the driven slow, right wing fascists one was masquerading as a football fan my crime in their view was to say that there's no such thing as an english race 
you're not speaking for the English, you're not defending anyone, and you're not a league. We have no other people in this country. For example, somebody's a Freemason, I'm an atheist, you're a Catholic, Methodist, Black, White, English, Scottish. These are all minorities. It, it's not whether we tolerate minorities, we are minorities. My a grandfather was killed in North Africa in 1943, and my father, who lost his dad, says that that war was necessary to make peace with Hitler in 1940. May well have saved his life, but would have been a catastrophe for humanity. Socialism is on the front line against fascism, which is the mortal enemy of freedom and humanity. To finish off, when such groups talk about historical precepts, such as wars, holy wars, uh, uh, crusades, defense, I look at a more recent example. Um, Oswald Mosley and his black shirts, we were on the front line socialists in, in stopping him. He wanted to take over the country, install a fascist government and advocated alliance with the Nazis and was against the war. So let's say exactly what these individuals are and were, not defenders of our culture, heroes, saviors, advocates of our country, but traitors to our country. Thank you very much, George. Thank, Thank you. you. A very powerful uh, address. Thank you uh, very much for making it. Uh, the, uh, the personal tragedies that you experience, I'm extremely sorry for. I, I, obviously, I can't deal with such personal things uh, in this meeting, uh, except to offer you uh, the absolute support of the Workers' Party of Britain. Uh, you can talk to us anytime, talk to the centre anytime uh, about uh, your own life and the uh, traumas that you suffered. But on the uh, broader, the, the, if you like, the societal uh, points that you made, uh, these are exactly what we stand for. Uh, we care nothing about anyone's ethnicity, uh, religion, sexual orientation, uh, or any other identity that they have. We care nothing about these. We uh, treat everyone as we find them, and everyone equally. Uh, and the reality is, that's what the vast majority of the British people also do. There are, of course, fascists in Britain, but actually far fewer uh, than exist in the European Union, just to choose one example, never mind the United States of America. Uh, Britain is one of the few countries in the world where not a single far-right elected official currently holds office. And that is a tribute to the British people. Most British people uh, are absolutely committed to getting along with people and treating them as they would like to be treated. And we are with the grain of British society in this. Uh, look, when, when I was a kid, uh, you got mocked for having ginger hair. You got called fatty if you were fat. You got called skinny if you were thin. You got called all manner of names if you were uh, from uh, a visible minority, uh, if you were uh, showing uh, an orientation, a sexual orientation that wasn't the prevailing one. Uh, that happens still, but far less, far, far less today uh, than it did. We believe in the goodness of people, and we believe in the goodness of the British people, and we seek to lead them. And you don't get to lead them if you show every sign of hating them, if you show every sign of looking down your nose at them, if you show every sign uh, of considering their uh, culture um, alien to you. We are a part of this people, uh, warts and all. Uh, and some of us will have warts too, uh, but we know that this is the only people we have. 
this people that we have. It's the only one we have. We cannot invent an imagined people amongst whom to agitate, educate, and organize. We must agitate, educate, and organize the people we have. And that's why language is so important. That's why a culture is so important. I don't know if Keith Starmer's ever been at a football match uh, or if he unconvincingly tweets uh, support for uh, the most anodyne team he could find. Me, I know everything about football. I could tell you who played for Crystal Palace in 1973. I know everything about the music. Uh, that our people listen to, the books that they read, uh, what's in the newspapers that they read and so on. Because me and my comrades in the leadership of the Workers' Party of Britain are working class. We grew up in the working class and we spend our lives seeking to uh, persuade the working class to follow us. And you won't do that if they think that you came from some other planet. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, George, and thanks, Dave. That was emotional and powerful and, and real. Just like George says, we are real, we're real people, forming a party for the real people. There's no us and them, it's us and us, the us lot party. So Thank you so much for that contribution. Um, you, you had me a little bit teary-eyed there, mate. You have the full support of the party at all times. So yeah, thanks, George. Um, next up, we've got our lad, Kieran. If you can just unmute there, lad. Yeah. Hello, George, always a pleasure. Thanks, Kieran, welcome. Uh, thank you, Tess, as well. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to address an issue that's uh, been Firstly, strangely enough, uh, been discussed in the right wing media. Um, coincidentally, it's something that I've uh, discussed with Rob for the past couple of weeks. Um, this is the, that of uh, WASPI, the, the Women Against State Pension Inequality. Yeah. For those that are not in the know. Um, the Tories have accelerated the rise in the pension age, uh, resulting in the theft of six years of not just state pension, but also the theft yeah of uh, an alarming amount of financial independence uh, disproportionately for working women of a certain age. Um, a fact that's bolstered by the experience of my mother and her circle. Um, due to the considerable consequences of these changes, uh, there is tens, if not hundreds of thousands of women um, uh, that are Remain in, um, remain in their working lives, uh, stuck in financial uncertainty, in some, in some places poverty, or having to abandon their independence to their family or significant other. Um, what can we do as a socialist party to support our working brothers and sisters? Um, and all that came before uh, that are subject to um, a pension age, which is one of the highest in the world. Yes, I was one of the first uh, in politics to champion the WASPI cause. Uh, so I know very well uh, what you're speaking about. I supported it in Parliament and out of Parliament. Uh, Mike Mansfield, a good friend of mine, was the Queen's Council leading the uh, legal efforts, which proved vain in the end uh, to enforce the rights of the WASPI women who, as you say, uh, had paid into a pension scheme and planned their retirement uh, based upon a retirement age of 60, which was then snatched away from them without any consultation at all, uh, forcing them either to work for an extra six years or uh, to suffer poverty uh, for another six years before they got uh, their due entitlement. It was grand larceny. It was state daylight robbery. And uh, of course, we wholly support the cause of the WASPs. 
by the time we come to power, of course, sadly, uh, they'll uh, likely all have passed. But it is one of many great crimes, Atos, that David spoke about earlier. It was a labor, it was new labor that introduced Atos. It was new labor that put so many of our people through these humiliating indignities of walk across that hall and bend down and touch your toes and uh, all of that presided over by uh, privatized companies with a financial incentive on uh, failing as many people as they possibly could. Although, as David said, most of them have to win on appeal uh, because <laughs> the facts are the facts. Uh, and if a doctor had been doing the test, they wouldn't have found against the claimant in the first place. And the WASPI women are amongst the hardest working people in the country. I know many of them. They're the people who were the backbones of the, of the NHS, of the schools, of public services, or in uh, other uh, public facing jobs. There were uh, manageresses, they were supervisors, hardworking people that deserved the retirement they'd been promised, and it was stolen from them by governments of both colors. Thanks very much for that, Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. Um, I remember hearing somewhere somebody said that the Waspy women will lose out somewhere in the region of 60 grand. Uh, some ridiculous amount. Uh, but what I like about your contribution the most is seeing such a young lad caring about us oldies. <laughs> and, uh, and if you're the future of the party and, um, and we've got members like you, then you'll go far and we'll go far. Thanks, mate. Okay, we have now Colin, lovely comrade Colin. Just going to ask you to unmute there, mate. There you go. Thank you very much, Chris and everybody else. Hello, George. Comrade Colin, long time. Good to see you. And to see you, sir. Um, I just have something that's a bit out of vein, perhaps in a way, as a kind of question. I, I don't know if uh, you or every, everybody else in the party uh, noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, there was a, a flurry in the newspapers about uh, a, a thing called Queen's Consent. Um, I speak as someone who has studied to degree level British constitution and politics and never had I and lots of my friends from those that era ever heard of Queen's consent. I've now found out more about it, but the flurry was that this secret procedure, which involves ministers nodding to the speaker and special scripted speeches called a rote, in the House of uh, Lords, um, th this secret provision that gives the monarch and the Prince of Wales um, the, the right to vet what bills are put before Parliament, to get consent from them that these bills be discussed uh, at all, and on many occasions, in fact, I believe uh, I, I've seen 162 bills since the Queen became Queen, where she has directly intervened. And that's the ones that have eventually been passed with what was called the Royal Assent, which happens at the end of the process. But this is something that um, had me going back to an old book, and I couldn't find any reference to that. That's Harvey and Bathurst, the British Constitution. And I've since researched it more, and I've sent something to the party centre only earlier today uh, about it. But I just wondered, George, if that's something uh, you could you'd come across, uh, and could you throw any light on it in terms of your experience in the House of Commons? Yes, uh, and uh, typically erudite contribution from you, Colin. Uh, the best place to, in readable form, not high constitutional. Uh, form, but in readable form, is to read the book of my former parliamentary colleague, now colleague in the Killing Kelly film, 
uh, the Right Honorable Norman Baker, former Liberal Democrat MP and former Home Office Minister, who was, as a Home Office Minister, required to participate in the rote and in the, uh, the very, very shady uh, things that happen in Parliament uh, beyond the public's gaze, and deliberately so. In his book, which is called And What Do You Do?, which is uh, the opening line of Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, in any conversation, And What Do You Do?, uh, so it's called And What Do You Do?, uh, you'll get it in the library. Uh, it's written by Norman Baker, and he has several chapters, including verse, uh, of the uh, arcane ways of the British Constitution, which are arcane for a reason. Arcane to shield them from public view, arcane to shield them from democratic uh, accountability, because you can't vote on them in the House of Commons. Uh, but highly profitable uh, for the Crown and for the Duchy of Cornwall, as you rightly uh, said, the Prince Charles is rather more active uh, on these matters uh, in not just the bills that eventually get passed, but in stopping bills going forward that might have had uh, effects uh, which were detrimental to him. Uh, financially and to the duchy uh, financially. So it's a really good, interesting subject. It's not the biggest subject. We're not going out with it uh, as the first uh, flag uh, on our parade, uh, but it is an interesting subject showing just how obscurantist all of this stuff is. Somebody asked me today in a, in a, a journalistic interview that will appear uh, on Sunday, uh, if if I save uh, Scotland, would I be expecting a seat in the House of Lords? I laugh. Uh, I abhor, it is anathema to me that we should have a part of our parliament appointed and appointed from an old school boys network that is handpicked to ensure that these apple carts are never overturned or dragged into the public uh, square so that the public who pay for them can see what's been going on. Well done, Colin. Good subject. Thanks, George, and thanks, Colin. It's a bit of a shame, really, isn't it? Because screaming Lord George has rather a ring to it, don't you think? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, we've got time to squidge in one more. We've got Kate, I'm just going to ask you to unmute there, Kate. If you can press your little button. Okay, hi everybody. Hi George. Hi everyone. Hi Kate. Hello. Um, yeah, I um, I just wanted to just to talk a little bit about the budget as well. You know, I know that Georgie mentioned it earlier, and um, the other guy mentioned something to do with carers. So I work for um, a local authority, and I work in the social care department, and I was asked to watch the, the whole of, of, of the budget, just to feed back anything back to our team about anything that was raised around funding for local authorities, in particular social care. And, and, and I know that you've mentioned one or two things, George, about you know a few, a few um, things that were gained from the budget, a few crumbs, I would say, but you know, I was really, really disappointed. You know, like um, um, we've got, a, you know, for example, we've got a broken social care system. Certainly my experience is we've got, recruitment crisis we can't get people to work in domiciliary care to provide you know to provide care for, for older people and disabled people we're relying more and more on unpaid carers which is what comrade um, um, previously was saying i mean local authorities we we have a duty and and it's the right thing to do to to, to, to support unpaid carers because they're essentially propping up the health and care system and, and and one of the things that we were looking for and carers uk were looking for was their but, you know, to be a, a, an increase in the meagre carers allowance that, 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 that is paid for people that have to, that, 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 you know, do unpaid care for more than 35 hours a week. There was absolutely nothing in there. So there was just nothing in, 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 in that budget. It, I, I mean, it was just really, really disappointing. 
Um, you know, like Rishi Sunak talked the talk. I mean, I've never listened to a budget before for the whole way through. And, and it was just, you know, half of it was just guff. And he talked about a green revolution, but the actual substance of it, I mean, like it was an opportunity for there to be, you know, big green infrastructure investment and projects, you know, like we looked to pay for our crumbling infrastructure. And all there was was like a, you know, like a, 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 a green infrastructure bank, whatever that is. So I think it was just a missed opportunity. I mean, he talked a lot about, you know, World War II and, and, and that analogy, because it is the greatest crisis that we've had since that time. And it was an opportunity to be, you know, to be ambitious. And there was absolutely nothing. It was just little bits of money here and there, the extension of the furlough, which is great, but only until, you know, I think until July, and then it's going to reduce, and then the employer is going to be expected for, you know, and then there's extension of the 20 pounds, but it's only until July. So then we're at a cliff end. And actually, I, you know, and, and then I, I, I mean, I, I concur with you about Keith Starmer. And I, you know, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm no fan. I was a member of the Labour Party and I left, but I mean, to give him his dues, he did actually give quite a good speech. And, and, and he said that they just paid, the tourists just papered over it. You know, we went into the coronavirus with 100,000 vacancies in the NHS. You know, there was nothing about the NHS in, in, in it. And, 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 and just quickly, just to say, I think one of the worst things was is this lie that's always perpetuated about borrowing you know like our finances we borrowed you know like the government have got record borrowing we've never borrowed so much and it and, and, and it's just a lie and it's like manufacturing consent it's so people think oh we're in such a financial situation you know we won't complain about the cuts and, and everything and actually borrowing it, it you know governments don't borrow like we you know like we're a, we've got economic sovereignty we you know we've got our own central bank we've got a currency issuer We've got deep capital markets. We don't borrow money. So they're talking about the bond market. And the bond market is, we don't even need to have a bond market. So I just think that that myth that's perpetuated about, about the fact that we have to, you know, the government has to borrow money to, 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 to pay for things and that where are we going to get the money from and we're going to be in debt for years to come is an absolute, it, it is a lie and it's a deceit. And I think that, I think, you know, maybe that's one thing that we need to kind of educate people about how modern economies and modern, and, and modern currencies actually work, that we don't have to borrow money, that the bond market isn't necessary. And, and, and what the bond market is, is it, it's just about draining the reserves from, 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 the, bank, from the central bank. So, um, yeah, I just think, yeah, that's just what, that's the point I wanted to make. So well, thanks uh, for making it. The hour is late, so I cannot do it justice, I'm afraid. Uh, but a very powerful uh, uh, contribution, Kate. Uh, I've got to congratulate you for your fortitude in sitting through a budget speech. <laughs> I found no it choice. difficult to do that <laughs> when I was paid to do it. Uh, but not only through a budget speech, but a Keir Starmer speech as well. Uh, you definitely deserve uh, an award uh, for that. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't see any of the budget because uh, for these uh, days, for the next uh, seven weeks or so, eight weeks, uh, my focus is on something else, somewhere else. So while you were watching uh, the budget, I was watching Nicola Sturgeon squirm, uh, which was much more fun than I'm sure watching the budget would be. But the Second World War analogy uh, is misplaced, of course, uh, because we were in a much, much worse place in 1945, even than we are now. Uh, and we were ambitious in 1945. In 2021, not ambitious at all. And the ambitions in 1945 didn't go far enough and in any case only applied to us because the same Labour government that was introducing the National Health Service here for us was literally paying people to cut heads off uh, those in Malaya and in Kenya and elsewhere that were rising up uh, for their freedom from empire. And of course, none of it uh, lasted long. By 1950, the government uh, was more or less done and by 1951 had already uh, fallen. And in that period, we were 
uh, intriguing with the United States. In the Cold War, uh, we were uh, seeking to do our best to uh, confront uh, those in other countries in the world that had already done far more uh, to look after uh, the vulnerable in society uh, and had pursued equality far more vigorously than we have ever done. I, I take your point entirely about unpaid carers and about the social care uh, sector. Our perspective is for the nationalization of the health service and social care merged together. These are not separate things. Social care is a part of the health and care sector. And for us, we believe that the state must properly run and properly fund uh, this sector. And unpaid carers, of course, will all, I hope, always be there for our elderly mothers and fathers, for our unfortunate uh, brothers and sisters who are not as well off as us. But the state has to provide the platform from which that caring in the home can actually take place, and it needs to fund it. Uh, on another night, I'm sure we'll return to that subject, but I have to go now. Kate, thanks very much. Thanks to everyone, and my apologies uh, to those that didn't get in. Uh, over to you, Tess. Thanks, George. Yeah, there's so much there. We could we could just talk all night, couldn't we? Thanks, Kate. That was a fantastic contribution. Um, thanks so much to all of our contributors tonight, and thank you to George, and thank you to everyone who's watching. If you want, you can uh, <clears throat> check us out at workerspartybritain.org, and you can sign our Corona tax at coronatax.org, uh, our Corona tax on big fortunes, of course. So join us, be the change, see the change, and we'll all see you again same time next week. Nostar, good night.